Hi, I'm Mel Cooper, and today we're going to talk about Puccini's opera La Boheme. Now, if you've never seen La Boheme, you have to start by knowing that it is one of the five most popular operas ever. There are more performances of La Boheme in the world than any other opera, except maybe Puccini's Madame Butterfly. So this is one to see. And for years, it was denigrated by the critics because it was considered to be um, just too popular. There had to be something wrong with it if it was so popular. Well, one thing, if you've never seen it, that you should know in advance is that I think that musically it's one of the wonders of Western culture. I actually think that if you listen carefully to it, it is beautifully constructed musically. There are four scenes. Now, everyone refers to them as four acts. They're not. Act w Scene one and scene two constitute one act. Then there's act two and act three. So that's how we're going to refer to it. And scene one is kind of like the whole introductory movement of a symphony. Then scene two is the scherzo. Scene three is the adagio, and scene four is the great final summing up. It's, it's, it's an almost classic structure in a sort of Beethoven style. Musically, it's also very modernistic because it's picking up on um, Wagnerian ideas about using motifs. It's picking up on the having the larger, much more lush orchestra. So the sound that you're going to hear is going to be absolutely stunning. It's also picking up on the idea that the music as such should follow the words that are being sung so that it's in slightly more conversational style. It's not, there aren't abrupt shifts between the aria and the telling of the story in between each aria. It flows in a much more natural way. But that said, Puccini had a fantastic melodic gift. And um, even when they're having conversational kinds of duets and things, there's a lot of memorable tunefulness going on. The story is officially set in the 1840s in Paris. And that was a period when there was a lot of political turmoil and there were terrific difficulties financially as well. So recently, people have begun to set it in eras like uh, the 1930s in um, Paris because it reflects the depression of that time. But it's set in the world of what they call the Bohemian artists. Now, the idea of a bohemian world comes from, I think, the 18th century. And it's about the fact that people thought of gypsies as coming from Bohemia. They didn't, of course, but they thought of it that way. And so people who lived a gypsy-type life, a, a life that was less anchored in the everyday bourgeois realities, were called bohemians. And then by association, that became what they called the young artists who were struggling to make it. So the original stories come from a set of novellas, really, by a guy named Murger, M-U-R-G-E-R. And he called his collection the Seine de la Vie Bohème. So it was about la vie Bohème. And la Bohème is a shortening of that and simply means Bohemia. It simply means that Bohemian world of the struggling artist. When the curtain goes up on Act One, you've got these two guys who are sharing a garret in the rooftops of Paris, and one of them is a painter, and one of them is a writer, and they're struggling to work. There's some wonderful music, and th it's Christmas Eve, and they are as poor as can be. They can't afford a damn thing, and finally, just to get some heat, the uh, guy who's the painter says, let's burn my painting. And the other guy says, listen, this is going to smell. Let's burn my play. So Rodolfo, the playwright, takes his play scene by scene and burns it. And they get a bit of heat. And Marcello is very disappointed because the play runs out very quickly. But suddenly some friends appear. Well, first there's a friend who comes who's just as poor as they are. Uh, his name is Colleen. But then the one who's a musician turns up and he's just earned some money by um, there was an English lord who was living in a flat in Paris and the neighbors have a parrot who makes a lot of noise. So the musician was hired to play his violin until the parrot dropped dead. Now the parrot wasn't going to drop dead from listening to the music so he explains that he bribed the maid in the neighboring apartment and they poisoned the parrot and now he's turned up with provisions, with money, 
everything is wonderful, they're going to have a great Christmas. At this point, of course, the landlord arrives, and he wants his rent. So the boys play with him and talk to him and get him to admit how much he likes the young ladies. And then when he admits he's married, they go into mock horror, and they throw him out of the flat without the rent. So now they say, okay, you know, let's not e eat all these provisions. Let's, we've got the money. Let's go out to the restaurant and have a really good Christmas Eve. And three of them are ready to go. But Rodolfo says, look, I've just got to finish this article I'm writing for a newspaper, and I'll be with you in a minute. They all go. There's this sort of quieting down of things. And then this woman appears with a candle that's burned out, and that's Mimi. She's the heroine. And she knocks on the door and she says, it's poor me, I'm your neighbor, will you give me a light? He does. The candle blows out. Uh, she then realizes she's lost her key. That's it. She comes back. The candle blows out again. They're in the dark. They're groping around for the key, which we notice Rodolfo finds and slips in his pocket because he's obviously attracted to her. And then he touches her hand. And that's where you get the famous aria, which in English is rendered as your tiny hand is frozen here. Let me warm it for you. And uh, he says, you know, you must want to know who I am. So um, he sits her down and he sings this brilliant aria, starting with your tiny hand is frozen about who he is, how he's a poet, how he lives, how he survives. And then the audience bursts into incredible applause because it's always beautifully done. And Mimi responds by saying, well, they call me Mimi, but my name is really Lucy. And um, because I, and I live here in this building with you and I make flowers for hats and things and I live right at the top of the building and I get the first sun every spring and you know it's again a very beautiful lyric aria and when she finishes they now know each other so in theatrical time you kind of feel they really have gotten to know each other even though it's been about six minutes and then the boys call from downstairs saying hurry up hurry up we're going to the cafe momus and Rodolfo says well I'm not alone anymore anymore and they say great bring the girl and he turns to her and he says well would you like to wait here and she says no I'll come with you and that's when they go into a love duet which is absolutely stunning and wander off to join the others at the cafe then the scene changes and you're actually in the streets of Paris Christmas Eve huge crowds people selling toys to children lots going on the cafe scene and all the people that you've met already are in the cafe and in comes a woman named Musette with her elderly lover who's a minister of state. So there's a bit of Balzacian satire here. And it turns out that Marcello and Musetta were lovers. She ditched him for the richer lover. She's clearly getting bored with this lover. So she gets um, the lover to sit down and order the meal and everything and starts flirting with people to get Marcello's attention. And then she sings this very famous waltz which is absolutely designed to make Marcello fall in love with her again, which, of course, he begins to do. And then she needs to talk to him, so she pretends that something's wrong with her foot, and she gets the lover to go off to get the shoe fixed, and she and Marcello get together again. And so they, um, she's, she's got one less shoe than she should have, so all the bohemians pick her up, and uh, carrying her on their shoulders, they all rush off to um to to have more celebrations and more fun and in the meantime she leaves the bill for everything all of them have consumed with the restaurant and the last thing we see as they're fleeing is the old lover coming back with the shoe and getting stuck for the bill and that's the end of the first act now there was another scene that was written that should have come next but it didn't uh puccini decided that it was too much and he killed it and so you skip a few months, and now when the curtain goes up on what's act two, but the third scene, you're at one of the gates to Paris, and Marcello and Musetta are living in a sort of inn where he's painting the walls and she's giving singing lessons. He's doing murals. And there's a, an absolutely wonderful beginning to this act of the music of all the people arriving in Paris, coming through the gate, going off to work. It's a sort of setting of the whole society, if you want, of, of lower class working people. And at that point, Mimi arrives and sends for Marcello, and you learn from her, and it's very beautiful music again, that she and Rodolfo kept fighting and fighting, and finally she couldn't stand it anymore, and they split up, and now she wants to find him and find out what went wrong. And so he, pro Marcello promises to get Rodolfo. He, he sends into the inn for him. Mimi goes off and hides. And 
Rodolfo is finally coerced into explaining that, in fact, Mimi has consumption. She's got tuberculosis. And she's been so ill that he feels guilty that he can't look after her properly. And so he's staged all his jealousy to try to get her to go off with someone who's richer and can actually look after her. And she overhears this, and she realizes she's going to die, and she coughs, and they hear her, and so then the two of them get together, Rodolfo and Mimi, but meantime, Marcello hears Musetta laughing inside the inn, and he rushes in to see what's going on, because he's getting jealous again. And then comes one of the most famous things in the opera, which is a duet, where Rodolfo and um, Mimi supposedly say goodbye to each other forever, but without anger. And as they're singing this, the fight between Marcello and Musetta grows, and they come rushing out and start screaming and, and so on. And there's a, there's a kind of quartet where the one couple is reconciling and the other couple is breaking up. And then finally, Mimi and Rodolfo decide that it's too hard to break up in the winter. You need somebody there beside you to keep you warm. And so they agree that they will get together again until the spring. And that's the end of that scene. The final scene is months later, it's the summer. Rodolfo and Mimi and Marcello and Musetta have broken up. When the curtain goes up, it's exactly like Act One. The men are trying to work, but in fact, they're missing their women. And there's a duet for the two men, which is quite famous, which again is about the two of them talking about the women and what they mean to them. Then the other guys turn up, and there is an enormous amount of horsing around, which in some productions, it's really pretty tedious. So if it's tedious in the production you see, just stick with it. Because what happens, of course, is that Musetta appears. She announces that she's found Mimi in the streets, terribly ill, collapsing. They bring Mimi in. There's this very touching scene where all the different Bohemians think of things that they can sacrifice, there being no national health. And so Musetta gives her earrings to buy medicine. Um, somebody else gives money so that they can uh, buy uh, uh, something to warm Mimi's hands, a muff of some sort. Colleen says goodbye to his coat that's been with him forever. He's going to sell it also to make money to pay the doctor. And all the others leave, and there's a final, incredibly beautiful, touching scene between Rodolfo and Mimi, where a lot of the music from their love duet and everything else reappears. And then the others come back, and it's Musetta who first notices Rodolfo thinks Mimi's asleep Musetta realizes that she's gone and so do the others and then finally it dawns on Rodolfo and there's this last great cry where he calls out her name and the opera ends now the opera has been recorded a lot, and there are some absolutely wonderful recordings that you might want to get. And this includes the fact that the first production in 1896 in Turin was conducted by Toscanini. And 50 years later, he was in New York after World War II, having fled from the Nazis. And he um, actually did a studio recording of Lab OM. So it's the only Puccini opera which you can actually hear conducted by the man who first conducted it for Puccini. And it's got a very good New York cast of the period, but I think my two favorite Lab OM recordings are the one that Von Karian made with Morella Freni and Luciano Pavarotti, which a lot of critics dislike because they say it's too lush, that it sounds too gorgeous. It's not tragic enough. It's, it's just a stunning sound. That's okay by me. But there's another recording, which I actually think probably is the most dramatic, and that's Montserrat Caballé and Placido Domingo, and it was conducted by George Schulte. And it's really, really good and really dramatic. There are loads of other recordings, all of which are lovely. Beecham did a stunning recording with Victoria de Los Angeles and UC Burling, who, for my money, is one of the best Rodolfos ever. He's got such charm, and he sings it with such good taste. And Victoria de Los Angeles is also stunning. And the rest of the cast are all up to that level in these recordings. But the Beecham recording was done in the mono era, and you might want to get something in stereo. And of course, by now, you can get loads of Lab OMs on DVD. My own advice is always go see the opera first in the theater, get your impression of it, then get the recordings or the DVDs. But this is entirely up to you. You might want to get one in advance and prepare before you see it live. Anyway, Lab OM is perhaps one of the most popular, certainly, but perhaps even the most popular opera ever in the theater now, today. And if you've never seen it before, I hope you get a chance to see a good production and that you really enjoy it. Thank you.